Uh, Dave Riley is a professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies, and he's an extension specialist for child development and early childhood education. Among many awards, he was recognized by the American Psychological Association for distinguished contributions to psychology in the public interest. He's an endowed chair. That's the highest award given to UW professors. He's well known for writing a series of age-paced parent education newsletters for new parents. Since 1990, these newsletters have reached as many as half of all families giving birth in Wisconsin. And in studies, the newsletters have decreased parent stress levels and improved parents' beliefs about their children. In the 1990s, he conducted a lot of local research projects that revealed a lack of after-school child care in the state. In response, 92 new school-age child care centers were created, which was one new business start every two weeks for three years. So in the early 1990s, he led the technical assistance and evaluation components of a large-scale demonstration project for improving the quality of child care in Wisconsin. And this work resulted in three textbooks for the training of early childhood professionals. Previously, he worked in the private sector. He ran a small business. He's been a policymaker. He was the elected chair of his town council. And how did he become interested in early childhood? In college, he found himself fascinated by the development of moral character. And he quickly learned to, to study how moral character develops. You need to study young children. So the title of his talk is Programs and Policies to Foster Early Development, What Works? Thanks. Uh, Pat's a basic scientist, and his work eventually makes the world better. I'm not quite mature enough for that. Uh, as, as Karen pointed out, I used to run my own s small manufacturing business, and I was a town council chair. I want to know what we can do this year to make things better using the science. I I'm tempted to, to just uh, take off on executive function. I'd love to talk to you for 20 minutes about uh, how great early childhood programs and families develop executive function in young children. We're talking impulse control ability to delay gratification, to plan your actions, frustration tolerance, all right? We, we know exactly what great programs do to uh, engender these kinds of abilities. It's no mystery. Great programs right here in the state are doing this today. Uh, so um, uh, we're not uh, at a loss at all about that. Okay, everything that you're hearing from the speakers today can be summarized in one line, I think, and that is we can have extraordinary, life-changing, cost-effective, fiscally responsible impacts on the lives of individuals and on our own society. But as you know, the stronger a claim, the stronger the evidence better be. And we do have such evidence, and you've been hearing a fair amount about it from multiple studies, not just one. Uh, but uh, in my slides, I need a clicker. There we go. Um, I'm going to walk you really quickly through that uh, Perry Preschool study once again because it's the one that has followed kids uh, for the longest. And it's a true experiment, randomized trial. So we can be sure that this program, we can have high confidence that it actually caused these kinds of differences. But really quickly, um, the children who were randomly assigned to receive uh, this program, uh, uh, their IQs went up immediately, as, as you heard. Uh, this uh, probably helped in some fashion to give them a, a, a much higher level of graduation from high school. Um, uh, their school success may have been part of the reason that the program children avoided crime uh, much better than did the children uh, in the comparison group. The children in the Perry Preschool prog Program were much less likely to have five arrests by age 40, to have been arrested for a violent crime, or to have been arrested for a drug crime. Nine percent of those in the comparison group had been heroin users by the time they were 40. This was a, this was a tough neighborhood. Zero in the control group. Uh, these differences show you one of the main ways that this program saved the public money. As you might expect, these children also had better work careers. They were more likely to be employed at age 40, to be a homeowner, to have a savings account. These are concrete life outcomes. The girls in the early childhood group were far more likely to be married during their prime childbearing years, and we anticipate that will have an economic impact on the following generation. You don't need fancy statistics to know that these results are significant in terms of cost savings, in terms of lives made better. The picture painted by these findings has been repeated by other similar tests in other parts of the country. Together, these studies show us that we can make a difference 
in solving some of our country's most pressing problems like poverty, crime, drug use. We can do something about these, all right? We can do it in a fiscally responsible manner. As Dr. Rolness told us, these programs return more dollars to the public than they cost. And uh, Rob Grunewald was his uh, co-author on that original paper. He actually does like kids. But, but he's making the point here, you don't have to like kids to like this program. You can be the guy who shouts at the kids to get off the lawn, you know? And, 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 and you should be at the front of the line asking for these programs. Now this raises a question. These programs are so surprisingly effective. In fact, if they were more effective, uh, we wouldn't believe them, all right? Whopping impacts. How in the world do we explain how a two or three year program for a preschooler continues to have impacts on a 40 year old? I mean, that bears an explanation. There's, there are several good explanations. You've heard them to some extent already. First, we point to early brain growth in humans, which, is, which unlike every other species, basically, our brains are not fully formed at birth. They continue to grow basic structures for the first several years. And so experience can affect the basic architecture of the brain. This can then have a lasting, lifelong impact on the child's ability to think clearly, to focus attention, to control impulses, that sort of thing. Second, the Perry Preschool Program, and indeed, virtually all of our most powerful programs focus on the family unit, not just on the individual. We have evidence today that parents learn a lot by observing their child care teachers, and what they learn will have an impact on the child for over a decade after the child leaves that program. This brings us to the policy question. What programs and policies seem most promising for leveraging the great potential of these early childhood years. I will briefly describe eight alternatives, each with evidence of effectiveness. Eight, that's about a minute each, all right, you ready? Replicate the Chicago model in our public schools. Now the Perry Preschool Program, which we started with, is the prototype example of this kind of program. It shows us what is possible under ideal conditions with master's level trained uh, uh, teachers and special foundation grants and all that. The Chicago study, what they did is based on what Perry Preschool did, but no special funding. Existing funds of the Chicago Public Schools, largely Title I funds, which they redirected from elementary education to the preschool years. Existing staff and staff salary levels, all of that. So it shows us not what's possible under best conditions, it shows us what's practical under real world conditions. And for that reason, in some ways, is even a more important study. Up to age, they haven't followed the kids as long, but up to age 21, uh, what you see uh, is very similar to results to the Perry Preschool Program in terms of educational attainment and crime prevention. School districts in Wisconsin have this potential right now. No additional funding necessary, although it would require them to do as Chicago did, transfer much of their Title I funding and other funding streams out of elementary ed into the earlier years where they're going to have a bigger impact where we know um, financial incentives from the state, however, could make the local policy choices there a lot more likely to happen. So there's a role for state policy. Number two, state-funded pre-K. A series of studies of state-funded four-year-old kindergarten, three-year-old kindergarten programs in Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arkansas, a few other states, have shown consistent, meaningful impacts on early vocabulary and math skills. The children have not been followed long enough yet to know look for the more dramatic impacts in adolescence and early adulthood. But these initial impacts on school readiness are highly consistent with the findings of the Perry Preschool Study and others. The impacts have been found for universal 4K and somewhat stronger impacts in programs that are targeted to high-risk families. That's, you always find that. So state-funded pre-K programs have the potential for real impacts. We have some successful models from other states to follow we also have our own experiences moving into three and four K programs of the last few years within this state. But if we were going to expand in that area, I would ask us to look at what other states are doing and learn from what they've done as well. We could also use more state funding to provide Head Start services to all the eligible families in Wisconsin who want it. We do this to some extent right now, but there's still an unmet need. Evaluations of Head Start show that child, children's experience immediate gains in IQ, in school readiness, but that these effects, these benefits, wash out by the third grade. It's been very discouraging news. 
However, if you continue to follow these children into early adulthood, like the other studies, you see the rebound in effects. And this was true in all these big studies. It looks like an initial washout, then you see a rebound. Most convincing study has compared siblings whose families often, they would move from place to place, and maybe the older sibling would be in a community with Head Start, maybe the younger sibling. You compare siblings in the same family and how they turn out as early adults, and you've got a natural comparison group where you're controlling for family background um, and, and so forth. And what you find is that those in the program were much more likely to graduate from high school, less likely to be unemployed as young adults. The effect size of Head Start is about 80% of the effect size for the Perry Preschool program. That's a big impact. Number three, mixed model funding of child care. I'm sorry, Head Start, mixed model funding. State government could raise the quality of community child care programs, especially for low-income families who benefit the most from it, by providing supplements to the private marketplace for child care. That's exactly what Governor Tommy Thompson did 15 years ago with his Early Childhood Excellence Initiative. Here in Wisconsin, we currently invest almost twice as much month to month in a six-year-old as we do in a three or four-year-old, with the investment in early ele elementary elementary age children being public monies, while the investment in preschoolers is primarily from parent fees. If we put our societal investments where they offer the greatest return on investment, they would, this would be reversed, and we would invest far more in the earliest years of life prior to school entry. This is essentially what the prior speakers have been telling us. It's also essentially the experiment that Governor Thompson ran a few years ago when he replaced welfare with the Wisconsin Works program, he funded an experiment in which 32 large child care programs in the state serving primarily low-income working families um, would receive a supplement that added up to about $1,500 per year per child, plus some technical assistance in exchange for promising to dramatically raise the quality of the stimulation that they were providing to children. The early childhood programs in the initiative were from all over the state. They included Menominee Tribal Child Care, uh, the Montessori School in Eau Claire, uh, the uh, child care program in uh, uh, Stevens Point where I saw uh, Senator Lassa at a press conference, and La Causa in Milwaukee, uh, so statewide. A state grant of $1,500 raises the budgets of these programs about 16%. So this is a public-private partnership with the public being a, definitely a minor member. Although uh, if these people are on Wisconsin Works, that shifts. That was enough, however, so our research team observed significant improvements in quality over just a one or two year span. Uh, the programs improved over time until they were significantly higher quality than comparison group programs or to themselves two years earlier in ways that we know will improve child development. For example, in, uh, in terms of uh, increasing uh, language and pre-literacy development in the children. Number four. Improve the early childhood workforce. And I'm talking here about teach and reward. There's a direct correlation between the number of college courses in child development a teacher takes and how much the children learn in that classroom. And I have to tell you, there aren't very many occupations that can show that direct relationship, which makes me happy because I teach in that department. <laughs> Every, it's a monotonic relationship. Every course, higher quality program, more child learning. Very few other occupations can show that, but because of the low wages in child care, people who receive college training often leave the child care workforce. The turnover rate in Wisconsin uh, is about 30 to 35 percent annually, which means trained staff are constantly being lost. New staff must constantly be trained. This suppresses the impact of any efforts to improve quality that we might institute. To address these linked issues of training, pay, and retention, Wisconsin began experimenting some years ago, I'm complimenting all of you in the room, uh, with its teach and reward programs, which help pay for college classes for child care staff in return for a promise from them that they're going to stay in the occupation for a specified length of time. Their employer also agrees to give them a small pay boost after they complete these courses, so the employer's chipping in, and the reward program offers a small stipend for accumulated total training of the staff. That's a public supplement. Does this program work? Well, evaluations have not studied effects on the quality of care directly, observationally, or child outcomes yet. But the evidence does show that program participants become better trained, 
and they do stay in the early childhood workforce longer. This program alone, in my view, is unlikely to produce dramatic lifespan impacts all on its own on children, like, these, like the Perry Preschool, but it's clearly a part of the solution to these linked issues of staff training and turnover in the, in the broad child care marketplace. Number five, engage marketplace forces to increase the quality of early childhood education. We're talking young star here, trying to focus on programs that we've actually uh, uh, have some experience with in the state. Now, Young Star is our five-star quality rating system for child care programs. Its aim is to use marketplace forces rather than government requirements to raise the quality of child care in the state. The logic is that consumers will prefer programs with more stars. Those programs will then have an easier time filling their slots. Over time, they can charge more for the higher quality product they're delivering. In an efficient marketplace, these forces should drive most programs to want to increase the quality and get more stars. Being rated is a requirement in Wisconsin for the two-thirds of child care in the state that accept Wisconsin shares payments, which helps supplement the uh, child care funding for low-income working families. And in fact, their reimbursement rates are even based on their star rating. So the state pays a little bit more for a higher quality product. In the last two years, the percentage of children in programs rated three or higher on the a five-star system has risen, as you see, from 44 to 65 percent, which strongly suggests that the Young Start program is really working. Programs are cranking up their quality. This is consistent with the experience of other states who have used similar rating systems. It's also consistent with what I hear from talking with actual child care administrators. They're often telling me, this is what we're doing this year to try to get our stars higher. So they are directing their efforts to, to specific improvements based on this system. Young Star isn't a new policy or program, but an existing one that the legislature brought into being, cranked it up in 2010, um, uh, which has evidence of effectiveness. One policy option is to increase the state reimbursement rate for programs with higher stars, both uh, to incentivize quality improvement to a greater extent, and also in recognition that these days, child care budgets are precarious, and a small public supplement for a higher quality product would help the better programs stay in business. Six, intensive home visitation programs. There are many varieties of home visitation programs. Typically, they involve weekly or biweekly visits in the home by a professional for parenting education and support. They are voluntary in all cases. The best known and most rigorously evaluated is the one by David Olds, as you heard before, the Nurse Family Partnership Program. He has conducted randomized experiments, treatment control groups, several parts of the country. Uh, they've shown uh, that these programs, when delivered well into at-risk programs, can significantly impact all the things I'm listing on here. They reduce child maltreatment. They reduce child emergency room visits. They improve the mother's economic self-sufficiency over time. They decrease children's arrest records in adolescence. This is a powerful program that starts in the first year of life. This is one of four home visiting program models which have evidence for effectiveness. Most of the home visiting programs in the U.S. and I think in Wisconsin are not replications of these highest quality evidence-based programs, but are based loosely on them in some fashion. Evaluations show that we, with all of these programs talking about, we can't assume the uh, benefits of the flagship programs unless we replicate them with some fidelity, with some care. Uh, in Wisconsin, we have not only a large number of home visiting programs across the state, but also some networks of expertise and joint training efforts, including expertise in our own administrative departments of children and families and health services. They have spearheaded grant proposals to develop a uh, more integrated state professional development system and to expand the use of these evidence-based models. This is all to the good. Um, so we have some strengths to build on. These programs are not cheap. They're four or $5,000 per family per year. But if you deliver them to uh, at-risk families, uh, they're cost-effective. They save us, the taxpayers, more than they cost. Two more programs I want to hit on really quickly, um, which are for smaller subpopulations. Multidimensional therapeutic foster care, you just heard about uh, from Pat. It's a program that provides specialized training, mostly in behavior management, to state-supported foster parents. In a rigorous test of this program conducted in Oregon, youth whose foster parents received it spent 60, the following year they spent 60% fewer days in jail 
In the following year, they spent almost twice as much time living with their own parents or relatives, which is one of the goals of foster care. This program ended up saving the state much more than it cost. Uh, Co-parenting education for divorcing parents. Our, our legislature passed into law in the mid-1990s a law allowing judges to require divorcing parents to take up to four hours of classes and to pay a fee for them, if, if it's necessary, on how to co-parent effectively after divorce. Divorce affects about 15,000 minor children in Wisconsin every year. The co-parenting classes are not available everywhere in the state right now. The largest provider of them uh, is UW Extension, currently active in 23 counties. But here are some impacts uh, of the course provided by the county extension office in Richland County a few years ago. They looked at lawsuits by divorcing parents over custody, over child support, over spousal support in the years right after the class. And they compared that to parents in the same county getting divorced in the two years before they started offering the co-parenting class, all right? Good comparison group. And, and what they were able to find is that uh, uh, problems with child support payments uh, were cut in half compared uh, uh, once they began uh, offering the class, compared to the own county, compared to the Wisconsin standard as well. Because these programs really work, saving the public money by reduced court costs and dramatically reducing the toxic stress of these families, some other states make these courses mandatory and they ask parents to pay a fee for them. Why? Because we, the public, are going to pay for the problems associated with these families otherwise. So it's not tax-based, it's fee-based. Uh, uh, this is a policy we could consider, making them mandatory. We have evidence that, that we already know how to do this in our state. And that was eight public programs <laughs> and policies in quick order, all of them evidence-based, some evidence of impact, some of them with cost-effectiveness studies, high quality. We have a lot of alternatives. We're not helpless to solve these problems. Our biggest problem is just going to be to, to decide where, where can we have the biggest impact with our precious funds. So if I summarized, we have new knowledge about brain development and family-centered interventions, both of which help explain the enormous potential of experiences in the very earliest years of life to change life outcomes for decades to come. We have some proven programs. In many cases, we have solid evidence that specific early childhood programs can save the public more money than they cost. I ask a hard question now. If these programs are so cost effective, why, why haven't we developed and funded them already? Well, it's always hard to create a new program when the costs must be paid today and the savings don't accumulate for a decade or longer, right? No surprise there. But we've made such commitments before. Dr. Jonas Salk, used the same experimental design we're talking about here in the 1950s when he showed that his vaccine could prevent polio. I've still got the scar on my arm to prove it. And in response to that research, we cranked up a whole public health service to immunize our nation's children. We paid up front. And like these early childhood programs, the benefits accrued to us as a society. It's hard to point to the child who specifically was prevented from getting polio. In the long run, we saved a lot of heartache. We produced a lot of productivity. We remain a nation of practical problem solvers, so I don't think the current opportunity will go unanswered much longer. The most effective programs had the characteristics that you heard the earlier speakers mention. It's, uh, we didn't get together, we just read the same research, and so we know. If you're looking at the programs with the biggest impact, they're earlier programs, not later programs. Crime prevention, we've been working on that for years and years and years, pretty ineffectively. Why? Most of the interventions targeted kids when they come to the attention of juvenile justice authorities, early adolescents. Way hard to change it at that point. You can give the kids and the families treatment. They still have a peer group that maintains the behavior, all right? Perry Preschool Program was not designed to prevent crime. Biggest impact of any program. Why? The early childhood years and brain development. So that's where the interventions really work. Many programs are helpful for all families, but the most productive, cost-effective, target at-risk families. The most effective programs tend to be focused on the family unit, not just the individual. We have evidence-based programs. There's no reason at all to invest huge sums of money in unproven programs. We, we know which programs are going to work. If you go to your physician, are you going to... Are you going to and your physician says, shall we use the proven drug that's been run through clinical trials, or would you like to try one that's unproven? This is a no-brainer, all right? 
Effective programs as well have high quality staff. They attend to high standards. They deliver their programs with high fidelity uh, to proven models. Uh, we have these guidelines, and so uh, uh, and, and we have lots of alternatives available to us. Thanks. Thank you.